Okay, welcome to this uh, penultimate session. Uh, we're going to stay two-dimensional a little, a little, a little longer. Uh, Martin is going to tell us how to define graphs in two dimensions. Thank you. Yes, so I'm going to tell you something about uh, some work um, Connor and I have been doing recently uh, about a data type for planar graphs. And because they're very two-dimensional and graphs are super nice to look at, uh, brace yourself for loads of pictures on this. So why planar graphs? So actually, my motivation for planar graphs comes from string diagrams, which are a syntax for morphisms in monoidal categories where you can um, comp like compose sequentially and um, in parallel. And when you want to implement these, you want or you need some kind of combinatorial representation of uh, these diagrams. And in the kind of usual case, like this one, some form of graph will do very nicely as this representation. But then when you have categories which have some specific properties, you need to also adapt your graph representation. And for some of these monoidal categories, they are specifically non-symmetric, which means that no, none of these wires are allowed to cross. So this is actually a non-example at the top there. But then also graphs are interesting in other ways as well, right? So we use graphs all the time or um, similar structures. And hopefully this representation is also interesting for other applications. Okay, and then a little bit of terminology on the planarity. What are planar graphs? So actually what um, we're describing are graph embeddings, which are drawings of graphs on a specific surface. And in this case, the plane for planar graphs. So um, one graph can have multiple embeddings, even on the same surface, but then obviously also um, embeddings on different surfaces. So this is an example. This is actually the same graph, right? But it's two different embeddings, and one of them is plain, and the other one is not plain. And it's planar graph if the graph has a plain embedding. But they get kind of used interchangeably a little bit as well. And observe in this picture up there that for this embedding, the order of edges around the vertex is crucial, right? So for graphs, we don't care. It's just a set of edges. But if we draw them, the order really matters, or this rotation around vertices. Okay, so how do we find something that could be like a data type for graphs? Well, we have two problems. First of all, graphs are cyclic. That's not great for like an inductive data type. Um, and composition is super nice on paper, um, but it's not very nice to implement. So for example, if I have this, and I say I want to compose these sequentially, then on paper, I just um, connect all the edges, and then, ta-da, we get like one edge at the end. But this is really difficult to do because you need to track <coughs> forwards and back all the time. It's not so nice. So um, what do we do? Okay, so let's, um, this is, let's meet our example for this talk. So this is a graph, a planar graph. Um, so what can we do? Um, there is a representation for graphs which is non-cyclic and is also somehow directed, and that is a graph spanning tree. So here we choose one of the spanning trees of a graph, and um, then we add on top the edges which are not in the tree. So a graph is a spanning tree and some non-tree edges. So that's the first step towards this data type. Okay, so now we have this. Um, so the actual data type is going to contain the spanning tree and the non-tree edges. And also, we're going to add another structure, which are called sectors, which are kind of places at vertices in between two edges. And we could store data at these sectors. So for example, the root, this little black box of this spanning tree, is a sector. That's a little bit of data. But it could be more data as well. But also, sectors are places or like positions within the graph. So this is like places I can point to and say I want to go here or I want to look at something from here. Um, okay, so the data type we're gonna use is gonna represent a traversal of the whole structure along this spanning tree. And then along the way, we also have to take into account these additional edges and also the sectors. So this is to, it's kind of the same thing, so it's like the order how we can traverse the graph. 
And then we can also draw it in a way how we traversed it as well to actually make the edges directed. It's not really direct to graphs, but it's more the traversal order. Um, okay, so um, let's look at this vertex in the middle here. So there's three different um, things that can happen within the traversal. We could meet one of these tree edges, then we're gonna follow it along and we ask for a subtree which is, att is attached. We could meet one of these non-tree edges, um, then we're going to acknowledge it and store it somewhere else, but we're not actually going along it because we're only following the tree. Um, or the third scenario is that we basically, whenever we have encountered an edge, um, independently if it's a tree or a non-tree edge, then we expect one of these sectors. Okay, so I said we store these additional edges somewhere else. So what is this somewhere else? Um, we use a specific um, data type for this, which is a stack. So what we're going to do, I'll show you a traversal of this tree. You see one edge is marked, so we're gonna observe this one in the traversal. So we start from an empty stack and we go along it. And then we, so each time we now go along because it's tree edges and now we meet the non-tree edge. So we're gonna push it onto the stack and then we jump over it as well, right? And then we continue the traversal all the way through and we may add more things on top of the stack, but we also remove them again before we encounter the other end of the edge. And then we pop the edge again. Okay, that's the other end. And then we pop the edge again and then we go back to the beginning. Okay, so we have this tree and the kind of a stack of information about the extra stuff on top. And this is kind of not quite actor code, but like similar. Um, so what we have is exactly these cases. So we use these stack of additional edges as the index of our data type. These, are, uh, these lists over here. Um, so we use them to index the stack before we traverse the structure versus after we traverse the structure. So how has it changed as we went? along. And then we also have this SE type, which is basically a Boolean type saying whether we expect a sector or an edge next, and that always alternates. So the, we can either find a sector, then we get some, a sector, and we produce one of these steps um, where we switch from sector to edge, right, because we have a sector, so now we expect an edge. Um, then push and pop are for the non-tree edges. So the first time we encounter them, we push them onto a stack, which then grows here. And at the other end, we pop it again. So this, um, the stack shrinks again. And then this span is when we encounter a tree edge and we're asking for the edge and the vertex where we're gonna go to with this edge. And we're gonna ask for a star step. So this is now one step and star is the reflexive transitive closure. So a star step is basically the, um, a subtree. So we ask for a subtree and then we get one step. Okay, um, right. And yes, so just for an example about the index. So we had this example where we pushed and popped this one at E, right? So if I look at this sector here, um, its index contains now this uh, edge E. And to say when things are planar um, is when the tree is indexed by the empty stack. Okay, and now the theorem is, or the claim that using a stack for these additional structures in, on the tree ensures that the graph is planar. Why is this? This is now due to an argument from topology when you have a graph and you contract a plane subgraph, then you uh, preserve the surface it's embedded in. So if a plane thing, and um, if I contract it, then it's still gonna be plane. So let's take the spanning tree, which is definitely gonna be plane because it's not even a graph, so, um, and we contract it, so we're gonna kind of pull them together and a little bit more. And then we have like a vertex with some self loops attached, which is also called a bouquet graph. And then from the structure of these extra edges, uh, we can now read off 
the surface. So this is planar. And you can, we can observe that this is a well-bracketed word, so kind of context-free uh, word, and we don't have any crossings. And this is actually similar to, um, so context-free languages are accepted by push-down automata as well, right, which use a stack as well, so it's a kind of similar idea. So only observing these extra edges and their structure um, gives you the genus, so kind of the um, surface your graph is embedded in. Um, and that's very nice. So um, another thing we get with this stack discipline, how we do the pushing and the popping, is that we get a notion of locality of the thing. So we've seen earlier that when we traversed the graph and we're in the middle of this orange region now, we uh, can very well add more things on top of the stack, but they all have to be removed again before we leave the region. So just like observing this index, um, we can have a notion of local or sub-regional structure in the graph. Okay, um, right. And now we wanted to, for this structure, the first um, functions to define on them, we wanted was to define zippers and then to define refocusing afterwards. So what is a zipper? It's a notion of focusing within um, your data structure to a specific substructure or position. So in this case, we want to focus on one of these sectors somewhere in the graph. And how you build a zipper is layer by layer. You go down your tree and at each step you choose one way to go down and you store everything else alongside. Um, okay, so how do we do this? So if we want to focus on this one, actually I'm now going in from bottom up um, because I'm starting from this, but it doesn't really matter which way around you go. So at each step I store two lists, one for the left and one for the right side of the things which are like stored alongside and then we go up. And this could be, in the case for graphs, it could be subtrees, left or right, but it could also be one of these extra edges. And then you go all the way back uh, up to the top. And so remember that the data type stored the order of traversal for my graphs, right? So in this case, left and right is not just a spatial thing, but it's also, so the things on the right are the things we have already visited in our graph traversal before we encounter this orange sector, and the things on the left are the things we will visit when we go on. Okay, now we have this zipper, and now we want to, what if, we wanted to now move the root of our spanning tree to this very position of the zipper. So we keep the same spanning tree, but we move the root down to there. And the question is like, what does it look from this other position? It's still the same structure, but it um, looks different, it's kind of different perspectives on the same thing. Um, okay, and we have to do two things. First of all, we have to change the order of traversal of the tree. And then the second thing is we actually have to deal with these stack operations, right? Because they might change as well. And changing the order of traversal of your spanning tree is actually not very hard, difficult to do. Um, but um, we need to do to put a little bit of thought in these, what to do with the additional edges. So something like this, for example, this edge from earlier. This is kind of wrapping around, this kind of um, enclosing this region, our new root, which is this orange thing here, lies in, right? So what we kind of want to do is we want to swap the order around. So now the push becomes a pop and the pop becomes a push when the sector then becomes the root. Um, and when we look at the <coughs> index, which exactly stores, so the index exactly stores which edges we need to turn, right? Because at this point, um, the stack contains all the edges which enclose my region, but the root of the tree should really be on the outside. So all the edges, in this case, it's only one, but it could well be more of them. They all have to be turned in the process of rerouting. So it's a little bit fiddly, but the nice thing is that we know exactly um, by the stack structure, which edges we expect to be turned. So we can beforehand 
say something about how the type looks after because these are exactly the edges which are going to be turned. And this way, we also preserve planarity when we reroute. So it has to be a little bit, we have to be a little bit careful with this turning round because the stack also kind of changes from top to bottom and so on. But like um, that way, we actually do preserve planarity. Um, okay, I have quite a bit of time left. So, okay, um, this was the things we've done so far. Um, and I think there's a lot of ideas, so I have a lot of thoughts on what these things could do or what these type of graphs um, could serve us. So the first idea is a kind of copy-paste job in this case. So but what if, so we had these graphs, so at the moment the edges and the vertices and also these sectors mainly don't really contain a lot of data, right? What if we actually put data at the sectors? What if we put we use a kind of context comonad um, like this, and we equip each sector with the graph rerouted to this sector. So we keep the same spanning tree um, and so on. And then the, so the overall graph, so this is this um, middle vertex again, because I didn't want to do the whole thing. Um, but you get a comonad by, you can return the thing that's currently stored in the sector, which gives you the same focus. And then if you do this twice, you get like a duplicate thing and it also works. Um, so that's one um, way we can use these things. Um, the other one is that, so this is not necessarily to do with planarity, but just in general with overconnected trees. So we have some trees and then we attach extra stuff to them. And these represent rational structures which are uh, between inductive and co-inductive structures, right? So rational structures may be cyclic. So if you go along them, you may go forever. But they have a finite representation. They have exactly a spanning tree representation. So you can work with them really nicely because you can, as we did with the data type, just work on the spanning tree um, and then keep the extra stuff. Um, and then finally, um, something which is more a bit of a puzzle. So what about if we didn't have the plane, but if we had something embedded in some higher genus, so like a torus or even something non-orientable? So I told you that just by observing this order around edges, we get this well-bracketed word in this case. So what is what kind of type of language is this or what kind of structure does this word have when we do embeddings on higher surfaces? I have no idea. Um, but it's like a super nice puzzle, I think, to think about. Um, uh, yes, and I think I'll leave you with this so you have lots of time for questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other questions? Yeah. Thanks for the talk. Um, so these planar graphs have quite a bit of extra structure, like you explained, like you have the spanning tree, but also the order in which uh, the edges uh, leave from each node. So uh, one thing you could consider is having kind of a function which takes uh, a graph and checks if it's planar, and pro if so, produces something in this syntax, right? So yep. how would you do that? Would you just have to, um, I mean, look at all possible orderings of the edges, or the is there something smart that you can do there? Um, so if you talk in terms of diagrams, and so these kind of string diagrams, you usually have um, some inputs and outputs as well. So you do have some um, kind of starting point. You start with the first input, and then you can kind of go along there. But like with closed structures, it, it's like, <coughs> yeah, it could be difficult on um, checking this, I think. Um, Do you have actually a proof that all planar graphs can be represented like this? A proof that all? So you just take a planar graph? Yes. And can you prove that they can be different? So, I mean, I'm not, 
I mean, if you can, if you can actually construct it this way, then it's planar, right? So you don't, it's not a check afterwards. Um, you just define no, it. No, you right? have a, assume you have a planar graph. Yes. Can you show that it actually, you can find the spanning tree, et cetera? Yeah, I guess you can, right? <laughs> <laughs> So, I mean, you always have to, there is this um, thing of, you have to pick a spanning tree, right? And there could be lots of spanning trees as well. Um, so that's, um, that you still have to do, but. Um. Uh, so you do, know, do you know if this, uh, this representation is like minimal in any sense? Uh, like if, is there parts of this data that we could remove and still have all the information about the graph? So like if I only knew about the, only knew about the sectors, could I get the edges or, or something from this representation? Yeah, I mean, you only need, so you don't really need the sectors, right? The sectors are more kind of um, to actually do this navigating within the structure. So like, but versus and edges, yeah, you need. Um, so I was um, looking at your algorithm basically depend on the tree covering that you choose at the beginning. Yeah. And so I was wondering if you take two different tree covering, yeah. uh, can you prove that the representation that you get at the end in the data types are actually equal? So you can do um, an, so you can do an operation where you change the spanning tree. So you have something with a specific spanning tree, but then you can um, take that structure and construct a new spanning tree, and then you can try to get to the other spanning tree. And each of <coughs> these operations would also preserve polarity, and then you'd know it's the same. Uh, graph if you get to the same thing in the end. Did you try to uh, make a quotient type that would not distinguish different spanning trees for the same graph? Not yet. <laughs> um, I, I know that. Um, so in the, in, if I remember correctly, in the, in the proof of the four color theorem in, in Coq, there's this kind of data types for for planar graphs uh, all around in the proof, and like a little bit, uh, uh, I mean, most of the proof is done on these combinatorial structures to represent planar graphs. Yeah. And I was wondering, like, how is uh, is their uh, combinatorial representation kind of linked to what you're doing here, or is it different? Yeah. Or how so do I was starting off from the um, representation of a rotation system, which takes us really literally that you need an ordering of these edges around vertices. But then to just have a rotation system as it is, is also again like very unordered and very, like you don't even know, like how would you do a traversal along a rotation system? That's all very, um, it's just a list of things basically, right? So it's um, nicer to do it this way around, though I think you can get from this to the rotation systems. Um, but I think for the actual implementation, it's easier to work at the level of the, this graph other than for getting the kind of traversal information. Thanks. Um, with this zipper structure, I mean, with a normal zipper structure for a tree, yeah. you can move along an edge in constant time on the tree structure. Does, in your representation, can you move along one of these other edges? Yeah, we'd like time? to do that as well. So um, what we'd like to do as well, because these um, non-tree edges they point to something else, right? And it's this kind of constant time read-only axis. And it would be very nice to annotate these non-tree edges with kind of, what does it look like from the other end? Um, so is that a yes? You can, or, <laughs> or you would like to be able We'd to? We'd like to be able to. But you can't, yes, okay. No. So in your data type definition, you had the star um, yes. thing? So I was a bit surprised because you're defining an uh, inductive type with cases and recursion, and then you have to use some kind of lists. Uh, yeah. Okay, so you have three base cases, and then one case where, could you flatten this out, or would it be uh, annoying? Kind um, of? I don't hmm. I think it would probably be annoying because you have more things than, oh, maybe you don't. Yeah, I don't know, I don't know. Okay. <laughs> we didn't try to flatten it. 
Uh, one last. Okay. Um, so this is more a, a remark to your very last uh, point that you had where you wanted to work on. So one place to look is, uh, is higher dimensional automata. And there's some recent work on how to define actually languages, which are uh, sets of so-called POM sets. And so that yes. may be something that yes. might be... Uh, yeah, thank you. So I have looked a little bit I'm into Sorry, this. it's actually not the last question. It's the second to last. The <laughs> <laughs> ah, this one? No, is it not? No, sorry. No, there was something about one. languages. Yeah, yeah, this is the language thing. So yeah. what about higher? <laughs> yeah, so I've looked a little bit into this. And I've... Um, I've kind of also thought about the kind of obvious things you can do. So what if you use two stacks? Or what if you use a stack of stacks? Or what if you, but, but all of these don't give you, they give you maybe a language, but they don't give you a surface. So it's like, yeah, I don't know if no, this no, is No, no, but I mean, that's the point of the higher dimensional automata. Yeah, yeah. They, they have transitions that are not just in one di dimension one, but in higher dimensions as well. It's, a, yeah. it's like a mo model of concurrency. And so there you can find maybe some inspiration to talk about languages of these, of higher dimensional things. Okay, yeah. Cool. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.